Hey everyone, I am Tiffany Standard, founder and CEO of Stimulus Inc. And welcome back to Supply and Demand, the real cost of doing business, where we're highlighting impressive and diverse women who are innovating in and disrupting traditional categories to really create culturally relevant products. The ways we're thinking about and nurturing our well being are really critical. And Beatrice Diction, a wellness innovator, and is changing the way we care for ourselves and each other. She's making inclusive improvements to the wellness industry through the Honeypot. And we're excited to welcome her to really talk about what's next with the Honeypot and how to navigate building a CBG company and discussing from supply chain tips to competitive advantages to building a supportive community. She is the co-founder and CEO of the brilliant plant-based feminine care line, the Honeypot. She became a symbol for Black Girl Magic and Black entrepreneurship when her business was targeted by racist viewers online and ended up earning a wave of support from thousands of new customers. We're excited to welcome her to Supply and Demand. Hi, everybody. How are you? Good. How are you? Welcome. Thank you. I'm grateful to be here. Same. First of all, love your background, as I mentioned <laughs> <Thank again. you. laughs> Where we This looks very comfortable, which my white background, I just moved into a new place. I haven't <laughs> had to add to the walls. and That's all okay. Stuff yet. That's okay. <laughs> So excited to have you here and just really have an amazing conversation. One about you, but two about the amazing business that you are building, the Honey Pot. I am a user. Thank you. Love your products. Thank so you. very excited to. I love that those here. are used. Thank you. <laughs> yes, almost gone. <laughs> um, I just remember when I first I've been using Honey Pot for about a year now, and I remember I was just going and I was just buying. I was like, let me get this one. Let me get this one. And I didn't notice was ones that I purchased and I got the one that was the herbal infused pads. I was like, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. What's going first, on here? Yeah. It. So it's definitely like a spa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then an avid users, so I go back and forth between the non-herbal to the herbal one. So I just, I really do love your, your products from the tampons to the wipes, to all of that. So thank you. first off, let's start there. Thank you. <laughs> I'm grateful. Thank you. So how are you? Let's start with that. How are you? How's your summer going? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Summer's going beautifully. You know, I've been pretty busy, you know, um, but that's consistent, you know. Um, business is good. Things are growing. The team is, you know, the team is growing. Everything's good. I'm grateful. Awesome. Yeah. How are you? I'm good. I need a vacation. Um, <laughs> like, I don't know if it's going to happen this summer. It may happen in December. Yeah. Because um, this is kind of our, our busy season, just prepping for the fall because we sell the corporation. So we work in supply chain, helping companies build better relationship with their suppliers and really streamline that entire process from the time you're searching to the time you're working with suppliers. So fall gets really busy. So we don't prep for it over the summer. Fall, we'll close out the year, not achieve It'll be it. crazy. Yeah. yeah. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> so for the feminine care industry, is it busy around certain times or is it always busy because we're always using your products, right? I'm grateful because we're in a, um, what's the name of our industry? We have, we make products that people need all the time. I can't think of what's the word right like, now. Yeah. What is that? Like consistent? I don't know. Um, yeah. we, yeah. It's ridiculous that I can't think of it. Um, this happens to me all the time, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> But we're in an industry that really isn't seasonal. Right. Um, you know, humans with vaginas bleed. The humans that are bleeding bleed monthly. Right. Um, you know, most humans, you know, nine times out of 10, take a shower every day or at least a few <laughs> times a week. You know what right. I mean? And like every time you take a shower, you wash your vulva, you know, right. um, for the most part. Not everybody does, but for the most right. part, right? And so, you know, and when you think about kind of the breadth of our other products, you know, we, we, we make things that can kind of be ancillary, but the bulk of our business is in our products that people just use all the time, you know? Right. So it's not really, there's not really an up and down season. It's kind right. of like, Consistent. Always it's on. good for you. It's consistent. Yeah. It's not like, oh, summertime, we got to do harder work or fall or whatever. It's exactly. Now I, need to, now I need to Google. 
right? What is it called? <laughs> like, <laughs> product usage industry or something. Exactly. That's, it's ridiculous. Right. No, um, gonna... We're going to figure this out. We're going to yes. figure this out. Yes. But, let, me but know, yeah. let me know the name of it. <laughs> So maybe a lot of the folks that we've been interviewing, like in you know hair care yeah. and makeup, they're in that industry. It's like there's never a time you only make up, never no time exactly. that you're done. Exactly. It's like consistent something. Whatever exactly. Like it's consistent. Lifestyle? Is it consistent lifestyle? No, I'm making it. No. Okay. no. Find it. <laughs> We're, it's fine. Somebody's gonna somebody's gonna chat it out when they when they see this. Got it. We'll, we'll see. Um, <laughs> so, so today, the Honey Pot sells, you know, nationwide, Target, Walmart, Whole Foods, Walgreens across the U.S. Yes. So what, what was the process of getting into those retailers? Um, and is each relationship different? Because those are, Absolutely. you know, take the store. So can you talk to our, our listeners about that? Well, the process to getting into, you know, our first mass market retailer was Target. Um, you know, the process getting into Target literally was the buyer reached out to us um, through our through our support email because she had heard about our brand through her hairstylist, which is funny. But we used to do we used to do trade shows and hair shows like that's what we did. We were on the festival circuit, you know, and, um, you know, and so she heard about it from her hairstylist. She researched us and then she reached out. Um, and that was honestly how we got the conversation started. You know, it took probably like a year because it takes a year. Like every year you're meeting for the following year to go into retail. You know, it, it might be a little shy of like eight or nine months. Right. Um, you know, but we started talking to them in 2016, 2017. We launched in Target. We were in Target for a couple of years before we started going into other mass market retail. I want to say maybe like late, maybe maybe not a couple of years, maybe like a year and a half. We got into Walmart after that, um, you know, and we've just began to build over time. The way that it works is typically you're going to have a retailer that doesn't mind being the first to market, right? Um, Target is one of those retailers. Target wants the newest, hottest, youngest, um, you know, their trendsetters. That's not to say that the other retailers aren't. It's the only, you know, it, it's literally just their business model. It's how it's how they kind of stay being kind of the hip um, yeah. retailer, right? That's not just again. That's not to say that the other ones aren't. But if you but if you're willing to take the risk, then then you know then. You know, the, the benefits of it, taking a risk. Exactly. Risk. Exactly. Um, and so, you know, and then when you have retailers like Walmart, when you have retailers like drug, when you have retailers like grocery, they are different. You know, every retailer is different because every retailer has their own personality. They have their own way of doing business. Um, you know, there are similarities. Right. When you go into grocery, grocery is not going to be first to market. Right. Mm -hmm. Because when you think about it, when you go to the grocery store, you go to the grocery store for essentials. Same thing when you go to the drug store, right? It's not a it's not a place that you go and you're like, oh, I'm gonna go. It's just not a place that you go to like get all your things and walk around. You're like, you're in and you're out, right? And so you wanna think you wanna think about retail similar to that, right? You, so you want to be in so when you but when you think about the targets and Walmart to the world, people really walk those aisles, right? People, you know, people go there for essentials, absolutely, you know. But it's just a little bit. It's a different experience when you're going to a mass market to a to a grocery or to a drug store. And so, right. you know, long answer for it. yes, it is absolutely different. Um, you know, and the targets and the Walmarts of the world were, are willing to take a chance probably before those others do, just because the movement is slower in grocery sometimes and it's slow, you know, and it can be even way slower in drugs. So they're, they're not held by the same movement or velocity that they want to see in mass market. No, you made a good point. So when you're walking through the targets and Walmarts of the world, 
your grocery list gets a little longer, your list of what you're shopping for gets a little longer. It's like, oh, five things, so you go in there. Oh, I can get this. I can get hair care. I can get that and all of that. And the grocery store, you're literally trying to be in and out in 10 minutes. Like, you know, you go to Target or <laughs> well, yeah. you're going to be there an hour or two because you're now discovering new products compared to you're not really discovering a new product in the grocery store unless it's, you know, something for, for dinner. Like, oh, this is a new version of something. But you exactly. know that you're going there to discover something new. Which exactly. is really great that you know the target of the world are, are doing that and they're putting out commercials, right? And exactly. Like, you know, acne ain't gonna give you no commercials. <laughs> no, I mean they it's just not their business model, right? right? They, you know, if it's like a smaller grocery chain, their business model is to serve the humans that live in that community, right? And so you when you when you're approaching retail, it's really important to keep in mind, like to not forget, because a lot of times as founders and business owners or business executives, we try to, it's like we try to create things from this place, from this imaginary place of how we see consumers and how they shop, right? The thing is, you don't think about them as a consumer, you think about them as human beings, right? And then you put yourself in that box. And when you think about it, you know, I don't know, I'm 39. How old are you? 36. So you've been, me, me and you, for at least half of our life have been going to the store, right? And in the time before that, we went to the store with our parent, right? And, you know, but, but for half of our lives, essentially, when you think about it, we have been going to stores. We, we have been, you know, I know personally, if I'm going into a Walmart or Walgreens, I'm probably going in because A, I need to get something from the pharmacy or B, I'm driving by one and I just need to get in there real quick, right? Um, you know, unless that's your neighborhood store and then you, you, you got your things that you get in there, but you don't want to think about your, you don't want to take human activity out of your mind. Right. Don't try to think of as people as consumers and how they consume. You have to think about it, how you consume and put yourself in the box. And then it helps you to understand which retailers are going to be the best one for you. That's, that's really good advice. I think people do forget that. It's like, you're thinking about it all wrong. Like, how do you shop? You're going into the store, yeah, what makes exactly. you store versus this store versus that store. What makes you look at a, a you know company different, this commercial versus no commercial versus like, oh, I just, you know, I'm thinking of going to a store. I just saw a Target commercial. You know what? I'm going to go to right. Target or Walmart. Like, exactly. stuff like that. It's like thinking about that. And I think people forget that. And that's also, like you mentioned, as you're you know, companies are thinking of building their CBG company. That's how you can think about if they're approaching customers the way you want to approach customers. Those, those are the retailers you may want to partner with. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, that makes sense. I love that. Exactly. Um, I read from um, uh, a previous interview that you had um, supply chain tips because, of course, COVID, before COVID, but during I'm COVID. Saying, girl, who doesn't? Right. But people finally started really talking about it. Now it's the sexy topic of supply chain and supply chain tips. And meanwhile, this shit been happening for two years. <laughs> right. Exactly. At this point, right? <laughs> at this point, um, some of your tips were having backup suppliers, having a stash of inventory just in case. Can you add to those tips for founders yeah. currently or considering building a, a CBG company? Yeah, man. Um, if you it depends on where you are in your business, right? If you're just starting out, you know, you're you're doing a small number of and small when I say small it's relative. Maybe you're just ordering there's there's tiny, which is you're you're ordering maybe a thousand units when you go to your contract manufacturer. And then there's massive where you're ordering every time you place an order, it's in the hundreds of thousands, right? So if you're if you're the tiny if you're the person that's ordering a tiny amount of product, and I'm just talking about in the world of mass production, because in the world of mass production, tiny is a thousand, right? Then, you know, you don't you're not you're not necessarily in a boat, in my opinion, where you need to necessarily have a backup supplier, right? Mm. But you probably want to have, you probably want to look at what's going on with all of your raw materials and your components and your ingredients. And you want to understand, you want to have a roadmap for what's happening. And this goes for every level of it, right? You want to make sure that your manufacturer is able to find all of those components, raw ingredients, raw materials, right? 
you want to make sure that there are no sourcing issues with anything. Because like this happens all the time where, you know, like right now we have we have we have one ingredient <laughs> in one of our products that only one company in the world makes it. Wow. Right. And there's no alternative, no substitute, no generic brand, no nothing. Nope. <laughs> there ain't nothing. Wow. So, you know, but they but they make it so good and it's it's a very important ingredient. So when they have to make pro or produce more because they have to go out and they have raw material supplies and all the things. Right. So when they have to do that, then we have to wait because that's just is what it is. Right. And so it's really important, whether you're tiny or whether you're massive, to kind of do work with your manufacturers or your suppliers to make sure that. To, to understand where their stock levels are, um, you know, uh, I don't it, I don't think it really matters whether you're tiny or whether you have a massive company where, you, you know, where you're and not even massive company, meaning you're making billions of dollars, but you're but you're ordering a lot when you order. Right. You're you're supplying for many retailers. You have a product that has high velocity and it's moving. When I say massive, that's what I mean. Right. It's really important to understand how many weeks on hand you need, right? And so we may have started where we may have had, like, back in the day, having 10 to 15 weeks of supply was sufficient, right? That's not sufficient anymore. You, 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 at this point, you know, if, if you're, if you're thinking, you have to be thinking ahead, which can be, which can be painful, now, the tiny company doesn't have to think ahead as much as the big company does, right? Um, you know, for a tiny company that may be ordering a thousand pieces, they may only need to be thinking ahead. They still may only need to think between 10 and 12 or 15 weeks ahead, right? But for companies that are massive, you know, thinking maybe 20 to 30 weeks ahead, right? Um, the only problem with that is that can be cash intensive, you know, so you have to make sure that you have the cash to do it. And if you don't have the cash to do it, then you may need to go and find yourself a line of credit, um, you know, that you can kind of pull on and pay off because the way retailers work is they're not paying you when, when they send your order. They're on a net 30, 45 or 60. Right. Um, and it, and it kind of, weighs more towards the 45 and 60 than it does the net 30 right even when that, they down 30 <laughs> it's never net 30 right you know? um and and you know and even when it is they're going to tax you for that you know mm -hmm. and so you know just making sure that you have enough weeks on hand making sure that you're paying attention to how things are moving in the store making sure that you're understanding your data right as much as you possibly can data is very expensive so, um, you know, having 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 access to those places where you need to buy data is hard. But if you're a brand that's growing and you have access to a broker, right, or maybe you're a brand that's raised money from a consumer venture fund, typically they're going to have access to data because they want to know how their brands are doing. Same thing with a broker. Like if you have a Target broker, a Walmart broker, a Walgreens broker. Even if even if all even if your broker is a smaller broker and only has access to the retailer that they're serving, that's okay because at least you can understand what the data is telling you, right? Um, you know, there's you know because things happen all the time, right? Like right. right now, the hot new thing is there ain't no tampons and no pads on the shelf, right? Because uh, that because, was one because, of my next questions. Because it's the supply the industry. <laughs> Because, no, but it's serious because because yeah. of the supply chain, right? Yeah. The, the, some of the bigger players have had issues with their supply chain. And it doesn't matter how big you are. It doesn't matter if you're a Fortune 500 company. You understand what I'm saying? It just doesn't matter. These things can happen to any of us, right? And so, you know, keeping yourself ahead of the game as much as possible, it is so hard to do, though. Like, don't don't let me hold you. It's really hard to do. Um, you know, and making sure that your operations team is set up because ops teams like you, like having having the right ops team is really powerful. And if you're a smaller company, you don't necessarily need a COO, but you may need a director of operations. Right. Um, you don't need a vice president. You don't need a president yet. 
But as you scale and get bigger, the bigger you get, you will need a COO, right? Who has an understand, a deep understanding of how to build supply chain. And if you're in mass market retail, right, and your and your brand is scaling and, and, and turning like crazy, then you need to have a whole staff of people, right? You need right. to have a chief ops, a chief operations, you need to have vice presidents, you need to have directors, you need to have all of you it. know, a lower management team, like you need to have the whole thing. You need to understand what's happening with quality, um, you know, because the bigger you get, the more attention to detail you have to pay, ha you know. And so it, there's so many levels to it, but it's, um, you know, it, it's it's a lot. Yeah, I want to touch on the the tampon shortage. So we've been seeing that, like you mentioned, larger companies that are experiencing it. You being, you know, a little smaller than them, but still growing and growing quickly um, with the the market size that you have. Would you say for like a company your size being able to kind of take like move past them because your greetings are different. So maybe they are having a lot of issues because a lot of what they're, you know, putting into their tampons is no longer available on top of other things. But you having different products. Is that something that you are able to capture more of the market now because your products are different or are you still experiencing well, issues well, with your supply chain? We'll be able to, we'll be able to, we're, we're not having any issues with pads and tampons at this moment. Um, you know, so we're able to supply our retailers. Um, but we, here's the thing though, we can't, we can't like super duper oversupply. Because what happens when something like this happens, because it can happen to anybody. It, you, it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter the size of your company, right? Um, you know, but, you know, and my, and my heart goes out to them because, you know, that, that's painful, um, you know. But um, we, I'm grateful because we do have supply on our pads, on, across all of our pad portfolio and our tampon portfolio. But we have to be careful because when things like this happen, you know, your, your partners really want to fill their shelves, right? And so if you, you know, and they'll order more than what, than what was kind of set, than, than what was originally in the plan. So the thing that's really important in a moment like this is communication. It's us understanding what is the max amount of number that we can that that we can that we can ship based on what we have and what and what's coming in, right? So that we can keep ourselves stocked. So if you know if if a, if one of your partners if their shelves are empty, they could they could they could order <laughs> really everything you got in just a matter of a few weeks. Whereas you may have ten weeks of inventory. And because they're because they're having issues finding it with their with their other partners, they could order 10 weeks of inventory in just three to four weeks. Right. And so that's why it's really important to keep your eye on the ball and don't necessarily order what they want you to order, order what you can what you can order to make sure that you can maintain and stop this whole time based on the weeks on hand that you have. That goes back to what we were just talking about, but also you being you as the brand bring being the one that brings it to their attention right you don't want it to be the other way around you want to say okay this is happening so we we looked at our stock we looked at our products we looked at everything we have this is this is the plan of what we can do right and this is and and and, and this is the max number that we can do you know right. and that goes for if you have stock or if you don't Cause I remember when we first, when the first time we went viral, um, obviously we didn't expect that, um, you know, and we literally sold out of our washes like overnight. And so we had to turn, and, and that's another thing is being responsible with your, with where your products are. If you have your own website and you're in, a, and you're in an omni channel of retailers, your website's gonna have to wait because you have to service your retailers because you have to stay on the shelf right and so in a circumstance like that where where you know some of my my uh i'll call them my comrades my competitors because uh, i never talk against my competitors i don't play dirty 
Yeah. Um, you know, where they, you know, like in in that type of a situation, you know, like if we had 10,000 units of wash, I'm just giving you an example, and, uh, and, and Target, Walmart, Walgreens, whoever was buying from us, it was literally a thing of we target, you can get 200 this week, Walmart, you can get 80, you know, like, or a hundred or whatever. Right. It was literally like we had to parse it all so that we could have inventory to ride us out. And it was literally like maybe a store got one or two pieces to put on their shelf. And so somebody would just if you were in the store at the time, at the right time, in the right place, you were able to get that. But oh. that was also oh, that's, oh, that's oh, also exactly. But that's also the time. Thank you, by the way. That's <laughs> also the time that you need to be communicating. You do not let them come to you. If mm. you know that you don't have it, but you've got a little bit, then you have to not put yourself first, <laughs> right? You have to put them first and you have to give them, and this is just my point of view. Not everybody runs their business this way. You have to, you have to be communicative. You have to say, this happened, that happened, so this can't happen, right? Or we're having an issue with this ingredient. You always have to be the one to over communicate with your partner before they're coming to you. Don't let them come to you because honesty is the best policy. Communication is the best way to do it. Um, because when you don't, it provides a level of failure and you have to understand that your buyers, um, your, basically your gatekeeper, they've got people that they have to answer to, right? And if you're not doing what you're supposed to do, then they're not doing what they're supposed to do. And if you're not communicating, then they can't communicate, right? And so, you know, it, it's really essential. No, you you brought up some great points. So one, definitely as a, you know, small, it doesn't matter the size, but just thinking of folks that are trying to fill up, you know, the different shelves and thinking like, oh, right, let me go capture this market. That's why I asked that question, but it's not always a great thing because it could also happen to you, right? You have product exactly. that can happen to you where you don't because now you're trying to fill up these shelves, but that you can have that same issue the following one. So making sure that companies understand that and expressing that to their partners, whether it's on your website, whether it's in stores, that, hey, I can only supply you this to make sure I survive to the next order or for the next store, one. And two, I like what you said of not talking bad about your competitors because I think so many folks put out so many things about, oh, this is a terrible product or this is a terrible service. And it's like, does it make your product stand out more saying that versus just focusing on your competitive advantage, whatever they that may be, because you never know when you have to partner. Yeah, and look, take the, take the competitive advantage, but understand that that shit could happen to you. Right. Right. And you never want to beat somebody while they're down because you can also experience getting beaten while you're down and right. nobody likes that. Who wants to do that? You understand what I'm saying? Who wants to who wants to experience that? Nobody does, right? And when you when you when you play dirty, when you when you um, when 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 you don't have a level of respect for the playing field, look by all means, Honey Pot is going to capitalize on anything that's put in our face to capitalize on. Believe that. That's what you do when you do good business, right? Sure, we we have competitors, of course, right? Um, you know, but there still is a way to, to do that, do it clean, do it efficiently, right? It would be silly not to, not to jump on the bandwagon and not try to take full advantage of this situation. Um, but you don't have to add insult to injury, you know? Um, and, you know, and, and I, I truly believe in treating people how I would want to be treated and, and to, you know, to, the Procter and Gambles of the world and the companies of the world that are experiencing these issues, I really wish them my best, you know, right. to get through it because because uh, because it's rough, man. It's yeah. rough, and it and and it's even rougher when you're that big, right? You know, I mean, it it something like this. Um, I don't want to say it can be catastrophic because they're set up for that, but it but it's but it but it's. When was the last time that you ever heard of something like this happening? 
at that level. Right? At least not at the time since I've been using tampons. I've never, I've never seen it, right? Right. And so, you know, so so my heart goes out to them because um because it's rough and you know, and I, you know, I, I, I want I want the competitive advantage, sure. And we're gonna we're gonna take it, but that that's nothing against them. That's just because this opportunity has presented itself, right? right. Yeah. Um, you know, and when and when they can get back in stock, they will, right? Um, you know, and then we'll just continue to play on the shelf together. I love that. Play on the shelf together. I love it. Cause at the end of the day, it's about the consumer. We all need great products. And we yeah, just, man. And women need these There's products. enough out here for everybody. We don't, we don't, you know, it's all good. Exactly. Um, so I want to jump into, as we're thinking of, you know, customers and community, and we all know the importance of building a community and with the community comes a lot of different people, personalities, opinions, and your community is everybody, right? It's your investors, it's your partners, it's your suppliers, people you work with, everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do you continue to pour into your community um, dealing with all of the personalities, you know, going viral for good or bad reasons, mm -hmm. But still pour into yourself and your team, <laughs> and your family, and your friends, because community can, can take so oh. much out of you. They can take it. They can just take it. But oh, you sister, get it. that's the that's the million dollar question, man. <laughs> right, I know. Uh, um, it's, a lot. it's a lot. First of all, it's very hard. Yeah, I'm gonna try not to cry. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's very 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 hard to do this work is very hard to do um when you when you have a team that's growing um when you have a founder-led company um that 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 is at the service of humanity which i believe that honeypot is i, I you know personally i serve at the pleasure of the humans that work here, of the humans that I, you know, that um, that work at the manufacturing facilities that we work at, that are, excuse me, that 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 make our products, to the humans that, um, you know, like I said, work every day at Honey Pot, to the humans that stock the shelves at the store, to the humans that. Um, you know, that buy our, it's, it's so, the levels are so deep and, um, and the people part is the hardest part, right? And, and when you are dedicated the way that I am and the way that my brother is and the way that this team is and the way that everything else that has to fan out, cause a million things have to happen before a product ends up on a shelf, right? or on a TikTok ad, right? Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, uh, countless things have happened. So much blood and sweat and tears and energy and so many things had to happen in order for us to be in this moment at this time in this space, having this conversation even, right? Um, and, uh, and it's, um, you know, the how do you care for yourself you just do it and understand that there's no way there's no such thing as perfection um you know like you know i have lived in a state of fight or flight for years i mean i mean 10 plus years yeah right probably more like 11 or 12, you know? Um, and a lot of us live in fight or flight. We, we just don't realize it. And so the things that happen when that happens, the way that your body blocks insulin production and, you know, and so when your insulin production is blocked and how five other things don't happen and how that stresses your liver. Like if we're really gonna talk about this, let's talk about it. Let's talk, yeah. Right, um, you know, and, and understanding that that's how illnesses are born. You understand what I'm saying? Like the stress, stress is how illnesses are born. 
because your body is not producing optimally. It's it's not like going like this. It's going like, wait, I don't know what to do, right? right. And and um and that's intense. You know, I I saw a shaman a couple of weeks ago when I was in Costa Rica, and he was rubbing my traps or shit. He was digging into my traps, trying to get him to loosen up. Is that back here? Yeah, and okay. he, and he said to me, "You're a Sherpa. You know what a Sherpa is? I do not. A Sherpa is a person that helps people climb mountains. Mm -hmm. The Sherpa, when people are climbing Mount Everest, all the stuff that they have to bring with them, typically a Sherpa is bringing that. And Sherpas live in those places where those people go to climb mountain. They're used to that climate. They're strong, you know. They're um, and they they hold people's baggage, right? And so, um, you know, you're you're holding yours, you're holding others, because you have, you know, I don't know how to not do that. I just don't. I don't know how. You know, yeah. I'm a giver. I'm a server. I'm a. Um, I care. You know. You know. I, I'm a person that if you. You know, it's another thing the shaman told me. He said, you for the rest of your life will always be the person. If one of your friends, even if you don't know them, if they call you and they say they lost their job, you're going to call 10 people to see if they got an opening to try to help that person out, right? That's just who I am. I don't know how to not be that. Same. If somebody from my team is having a hard time, I don't know how to be like, what do you need? I don't, or excuse me, how to not be like, what do you need? Is there anything? I don't know how to not lead with um, vulnerability. I, I just, you know, I don't know how to be like, everything's okay when shit just ain't okay. I don't know how to do that, you know? And I don't know how to, to not um, provide the humans that make all of this possible to provide them that space that if they're not, if everything's okay for them to, to, they have to be able to say it. They have to be able to communicate. I just, we don't know how to run an organization that doesn't do that. And when, when, when that is the type of organization that you have, a lot comes with it because then you're actually serving humans. It's not a machine. Honeypot is not a machine. We are a very human first company all the way from how we serve our humans that work here. For me, how do I even serve, how do I serve the human that comes here to clean my house? Mm -hmm. I tell Diana, I love her because I do, because we would not, what would happen if she can't come here and clean? Right. You want like how, I need order. Right. And, um, you know, and so there's just a lot because you're running your company, you're running your team, you're running your life, and then you still are dealing with trauma, too. Mm. Just for whatever reason. So, like, all these things are happening at the same time, you yeah. know, and it's, um, you know, uh, you know, don't make me wrong. I, I take care of myself to the utmost best of my ability. But by no means am I perfect at it. By no means, right? Yeah. Um, I, I've, I'm just getting used to just doing what I can, man. If I can, I can. Um, you're going to get me emotional because I'm just thinking about <laughs> what my therapist says, and she calls it delayed gratification, where you, you wait to celebrate something, you wait to... Because you're always thinking of, at least for me, perfection and making sure my team is good, making sure my family is good. And then I delay my celebration of things until they are okay, until my friends are okay, until my company's okay, until my customers are okay. Right. And once they get there, I'm still thinking of the next thing of, well, are they going to be okay the next time? And then I'm like waiting to like even celebrate the little things, even when we have a win or, you know, a new customer or anything. I'm like, all right, well, we've got five more customers to get. I'll celebrate the next one later. <laughs> I'm not a celebrator either. You know, and my reason for that is because I'm striving for excellence. Yeah. We are striving, striving for excellence. So I don't really, um, I don't think like, I don't want to say this and I, and I'm not trying to be offensive towards anybody, but I just, 
don't think that there's anything special about us striving for excellence. I think that that's just what we do, right? So it's not that I don't want to celebrate it and I don't want to think say that it's great. Like it is great, but like that's what we're here to do. So like there's nothing special about that's that. right. <laughs> you know, like we're doing our jobs. Like we're, we're doing, to- yeah, like yeah, yeah, like like this is what we're here to do and do it well. Like yeah. y- you know, um, you know. So I I I I'm like you. I don't get caught up in that. Like it's cool. It's great. Right. This is wonderful, right? But like. Let's keep moving. Right. You know? Let's keep yeah. moving. Yeah. I, I think about that a lot. So no, let me not get all teary. I could I <laughs> go into <laughs> for a minute. Um, so let's jump into this. Uh, we're starting to see more black women creating companies that really help us take control of our health, right? Whether it's mental health, physical health. And I'm starting to see more companies connect women of color to culturally competent <laughs> healthcare. <laughs> sensitive providers, all of that, and really take control of our health. Cause I feel like we've always been reactive versus, versus proactive, right? And then your yeah, story- like that company, Hue. Yes, Hue, and then Health in the Hue, all of that, right? Yeah, company, so, Health in the Hue, that's what I'm talking yes, about. Yes, Health in the Hue, um, who I know well, Ashley. Um, and we're starting to see more of that. And a lot of times we're reactive versus pr- proactive with our health. And I feel like the honey pot can help us be more proactive. That's the point because, of what we do. Right? Like, it's like, hey, you notice something different when you use these products thinking that mm-hmm. this was supposed to, you supposed to feel this way. Like, no, you're not supposed to feel this way for mm-hmm. years. Your period is not supposed to be painful. Like, all these no. things, and once you switch off, you're like, oh, now yeah. I it. Now right. I, I like something different. Like I got a little spa down here. That's how it's supposed to feel, right? Right, right. So where do you want to see more black women innovating in the wellness space? So we're seeing it now with healthcare, but what else is yeah. this? Yeah, health the the it's what's it called? Health in the hue. Somebody was just texting me about yeah, it. health in the hue. Yeah. Health in the hue. Violet is really dope. Who's Violet? I don't know. That. Um yeah, it's it's dope. It's essentially doing the same a similar thing that Health in the Hue is doing. Um, you know, I, I want to see us doing, I want to see us doing massive things, right? I want to see us striving for, you know, obviously doing things like this. Um, I just did some research and I was looking at how many companies there were that were, that have IPO'd, right? Um, that were black owned and what I found and I and if I'm if I'm misstating anything right don't judge me but what my research found with was that there is nine companies on the stock exchange where and and there are 3767 companies that are publicly traded on the stock exchange right mm-hmm. only nine of those companies were black owned you know how many companies that were black owned were also women owned? How mm-hmm. many would you guess? One. One. Yeah, I figured. I knew it was something like one or two. I yeah, it like and it's um, Kathy Hughes. Oh, from Radio One. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, she, I have a radio show with, uh, with Miss Kathy Hughes. <laughs> yeah, Miss Kathy Hughes, and she's the only one ever since it's ever been done. Wow. So. And that led me to think about how that makes sense of why the disparity is as huge as it is with Black women when it comes to private equity and venture capital. That's why. That's one of the reasons. There's many reasons, but that's one of the main reasons why, right? And so it made me think, you know, for years I've talked about exits and things like that but for some reason probably what's happened with us over the past um you know the past six weeks we're cool i feel like things are calmed down now which i'm grateful for everybody's support um you know and i'm grateful things were able to chill out um you know but it really got me to thinking because you know, these these types of conversations aren't necessarily popular in the black community, right? Sure. Um, you know, even at the thought of Honey Pot having an exit, people were up in arms, 
even though it wasn't true. So first of all, I want to see us heal whatever that trauma is, right? Because, um, you know, that that's just the nature of how business works. <laughs> you, you can't, you, the more, the more you grow, you know, the more, white the, men have gotten to where they are. Their company gets bought and they that's just how it's, 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 it's just how it works. Right. Yeah. But also, um, exits are a thing, but also going public is a thing. I don't, I don't, you know, going public is very hard. Um, I was just talking to one of my friends the other day and she was talking about how people just, companies haven't necessarily figured out how to go public, especially in a market like this, where we're literally flying into a recession, right? But, um, you know, but us really considering from the, from the human level, even the person who doesn't necessarily want to go in business, right? But trying to figure out, you know, for the people that, that do want to go in business, how do they want to scale and grow? Because I want to see more of us having companies that have huge growth potential, crazy high velocity, mm -hmm. tech companies that, that are, you know, can get massive valuations like, you know, like Health and the Hue and Violet, um, yeah. you know, because they're, because they're really creating that. I mean, think of how many black women die at the hand of just having a baby, yeah. right? You know, I, you know. Um, having family, you know, that, that, you know, my, my, one of my family members that's very close to me, um, you know, having to have had to be in the hospital for something, you know, and having, having other family members having to go off on people in the hospital because of mistreatment or just not, these types of things just shouldn't happen. You know, we just should we, we shouldn't have to be so we shouldn't have to fight for explaining that we're not well or that this shouldn't be done that way or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I think creating creating for, for white space, but that's, that's a little bit outside of the box. Who knew that Health and the Hue needed to be here? I mean, obviously they did, but I just love how they were able to put one and two together to say, Somebody needs to be in the middle to help facilitate this. That is a massive business. Right. And that is a big enough problem to be solved. I mean, that, right? Yeah, man. And who's going to go back and rewrite those gyne the those obstetrics and gynecologists and gynecologists? Yes. Right? Yes. I mean, just understanding more Black women research on why we have breast cancer four times more than white women. Why do we have fibroids four times than white women and have to get hysterectomies to not even have kids, right? Exactly. There's so many things that we just don't know and there's never been enough research to know why we're the highest. But there there hasn't been enough research for that, but um, you know, but the conversation that we were having earlier around stress. That too. Right we are a severely underserved black women are a severely underserved community not only because we're black but like there's so many other levels to that right and when you're a, when you're a pure, when you're a truly underserved community what happens when you're underserved you're underserved and and you are under an unbelievable amount of stress that's not even yours right you're carrying the load for your family. You're carrying the load. You, you know what I mean? When you think, when you, I can, I can see how we are four times more, if not more than that. Because when you think that, self care wasn't a thing that the black people could do. We couldn't do that. Yeah. We had to take care of other people's babies. Right. We had to take care of full on adults. Right. A com the the disgustingness of slavery is still being dealt with today, right? Because we never dealt with the trauma that happened with that. We never dealt with the stress that has just be, that has just been hereditary and passed down and down and down and down and down. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. You get, you're damn right. We're, we're four times more capable because we've probably got that much more stress. Right, right? from our 
grandparents or a mom that passed it down. And, to and that's not to say, me. yeah. And that's not to say that other humans from other, I, I try not to even look at race, but in this con, this is one of the things where the construct went against humanity. I mean, there's so many ways the construct of race went a million ways, but this is definitely one of the ways, right? When you, you have to look at what has happened in the underserved community, and then that's going to tell you why. Because I just went to my functional doctor yesterday, and she was telling me, "B, you know, you're you're not making your insulin production, and that same thing I was just explaining to you, right?" And so because all of these things aren't happening, my body is not doing what it needs to do. And if you're not aware of that or conscious of that, understanding the foods that you have sensitivity to. If you don't know that you're, girl, I am severely allergic to gluten, dairy, and soy. That shit is in everything. That's yeah, that's definitely everything. I just became vegan. I was like, shit, I can't eat nothing. <laughs> but 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 that but see, but that's yeah, my is. point. Yeah. What is that? Ha what happens every time I eat any of those bodies, any of those types of foods? Yeah. My my gut has has to heal. I'm just saying this is this is just a, a very basic, bare minimum conversation about health. There, there can be an hour in itself talking about the overall but, health from yeah insulin issues that I'm having to relaxes and saying you're so stressed out. I'm seeing it in your hair. I'm like I know, but sure. but that but that's my point. So yeah. you yeah. know, us creating ways to really look at what's happening, like really what's happening, like for real, for real, not you know. And and so I can't give you any specifics of things that I want to see different, but I think creating creating companies that help us have conversations with ourselves. You know, I'd like to see more functional medical come. I'd like to see functional medicine actually be affordable. That would be great. That would be most people don't even know that that even exists. Right? I'd like to see when you go to the doctor, the doctor is not just doing run of the mill tests for your cholesterol and your blood pressure and this and that, but like really doing a test of you should know what you should be eating and what you shouldn't be eating. It should, right. it should not be, that should be a personal thing. That should not just be, you know what I mean? Like yeah, a separate eat. nutrition that you have to go to to understand yeah, what's, good man. For your body and what's not good for your body. Yeah. You know, I'd like to see more funds that are really making funds for humans of color and humans that have, that are in dis for real doing it though. Not, right. And that's, I'm not saying that there aren't com that there aren't I'm funds saying, that are doing I'm it. I, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying, for real, for real. I mean, for real, for real, doing it. And you know, um, you know, I, I I'd like to see, um, the, you know, I I'd like to see there be more access for people who are truly, truly, truly working to grow their brands right that access that can really catapult them to where they need to go you know these the, i mean you know and i can't say anything i can't say specific um you know places but i but but to me these are the things these are some of the things that are really missing um you know and and helping people to get themselves together from a real place, it it, sh it shouldn't be so expensive. Shouldn't be. No, I that agree. that only a certain exactly that only a certain human can go and do this. You know. Yeah. We can talk on this for an hour. <laughs> I know yeah. we can go deep into that because I, I agree with you, and it, it's so much. It's so deep, physically, mentally, that we can just really cover. Um, so to close us out, what's next for the honey pot? Honestly, we just got our head down, man. That's always my answer. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, we we just working, man. We're just we're That's just working. Some time, just focused. We, we're just focused and we're just doing what we need to do and paying attention to what we need to pay attention to and trying to understand the things that we don't know and that we that, you know. Um so I I think I think that that's what's next for us. Just keeping things keeping our head, uh, you know. Our, our eye on the ball and um 
you know, and continuing to serve at the pleasure of, of humanity across every place that we serve, right? From inside our work, from inside of Honey Pot to, you know, our partners that, that actually make our products to, um, you know, the humans that buy it, our retail partners and everything that, ha you know, our partners that like help us, people that come in and do art and create our website. Like, I just want to, I just want to continue to just have good energy flow through every channel that I'm probably forgetting some, but because that's how we do what we do best is when everything is kind of flowing, you know? So that's what we're doing. Awesome. So thankful to be speaking with you. Amazing conversation. Everyone, I am Tiffany Standard, founder and CEO of Stimulus Inc. And you're watching Supply and Demand, the real cost of doing business here with our guest, Beatrice Dixon, the co-founder and CEO of The Honeypot. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you. Thank you.